All right. Hi, everyone. I am Katie Biggs from NeighborWorks Montana, and I'm going to be your room host for this breakout session today. We are so excited that you've joined us today, and we hope you're having a great time at the conference so far. We ask, as you all are, to please mute your lines and use the chat function. We do have a small group, though, so if you do want to hop on video, you're more than welcome to. Um, but you just use the chat function as much as you would like to. Just a few housekeeping items. All sessions are being recorded. Please meet your lines and turn off your video, um, or you don't necessarily have to. Please click the chat icon and make sure you select all panelists and attendees and enter your name, organization, and location so we know who you are and where you're joining us from. Each of you should have received a whiteboard paddle if you registered before a certain point. If you find something inspiring, exciting, or new, write a quick adjective on the whiteboard and hold it up and let us know. Um, I am excited today to bring you Courtney and Anne. They are from the Media Lab at University of Montana, and they are fantastic in sharing what they will be sharing. So I'm going to turn myself off video and let the two of them do their thing. Um, but you are in for a treat with these folks today. Uh, I'm Ann Bailey. I'm the director of the Montana Media Lab at the School of Journalism at, at the University of Montana. Um, and just real quickly, I'll kind of tell you what the Media Lab does. Uh, we're basically, we basically do two things. So we offer trainings and workshops for um, people in the community, for professionals, um, students, anyone who's interested in learning digital media skills. So we offer workshops in podcasting and writing, social media, video, um, and audio production. Um, and then we also do outreach into, into rural communities across the state and on the reservations. So we work with high school students teaching them news literacy and digital storytelling. So that's what we do. My background is primarily in photo and video. I got my master's at the University of Montana in photojournalism and I've been working in um, different types of media ever since. So primarily video and uh, now radio more and more. So that's me. Thanks, Anne. And I'm Courtney, Courtney Kogel, and I am a professor at the University of Montana School of Journalism. Um, I have a background primarily in print media, although um, actually, I now that I think about it, I spent more time in kind of online media than print, um, as it turns out. Um, I've been a reporter for the Associated Press, for Lee Newspapers, um, and the Chronicle of Higher Education. And I have also started a magazine. I started a magazine in, in Missoula about, gosh, 15 years ago, 20 years ago now, um, called newwest.net. And that rode the wave of kind of the early, um, the early web 2.0 bubble, and then also kind of burst along with the web 2.0 bubble. Um, and I specialize in um, political reporting as well as um, online, uh, all the online things, including social media. And then uh, on the other side of my life, I'm a business owner. I own a small bakery and farm with my husband. Um, and so I've done a fair amount of marketing around that um, and PR. And I have also done, I also do most of the marketing and um, communication for the School of Journalism as well. So I've been on both sides of the mic. Um, more often I'm behind the mic than in front of it. Um, and there's a good reason for that. Uh, Anne has tried to train me as best as possible to be better in front of a camera, but I'm much more comfortable with a notebook and a pen. Um, so I'm going to talk to you a little bit about first about um, what the reporting process is like for, for a journalist or a reporter um, with some tips on how you can best engage when you get that phone call. Um, hey, this is so-and-so from the X times and I want to talk to you about this story and you kind of panic a little bit or if you have a story that you feel like needs some media attention that you want to get some earned media out there, um, how you might think about doing that as well. So just to get started, um, why don't, if you feel comfortable, what, how about everybody just, um, if, you, if you have an idea or something that you've struggled with in working with media or a question that you have, why don't you type it into chat now and we'll just kind of try to get through it as, as, we, as we work through today's um, conversation and, and, uh, and presentation. 
Um, we'll some of kind of some... monitor, sorry, Court. We'll monitor okay. the chat for each other. So as you all have questions, feel free to drop it in the chat. And if Courtney's presenting, I'll kind of direct questions to her from you all and vice versa. Um, and when we get to my section of the presentation, I'm gonna focus more on sort of the, um, you know, how do you, what is a visual journalist or a radio journalist looking for from you and how can you present your message better to them uh, so that you're getting across what you want to get across and it's, it's a clear message. She also has really good tips on how to, you know, not look like an idiot in front of the camera. So that's also helpful. <laughs> Um, and then at the end, we'll open it up for more questions. But if you, like I said, feel free to pop questions into the chat or raise your hand if you want to um, pipe up and ask a question. Um, this is a small group. So instead of this being more webinar style, you know, let's have a conversation about this. Sometimes it's just really helpful to talk to a working journalist about what they do and how they work and um, how how the whole media landscape works. So feel free to, to pipe up and ask a question either in chat or um, raise your hand. And at the end, we will give time for questions. Um, and also to start thinking now if you want to volunteer, we're going to give a little bit of time at the end um, if you'd like to volunteer for either Anne or I to interview you on camera to put some of these things into practice. So first of all, um, I'm gonna walk you through some general tips on dealing with the media. And I'm gonna start with the don'ts because there's more don'ts than there are do's and there's a big do that helps you not do all the don'ts. How is that for a word spaghetti? Um, so the first thing you wanna know when dealing with the media is that more often than not, they are part of your community and they are doing a job. Dare I say, they're doing a really important job in your community as a reporter, um, as a photographer, as a, no matter what, no matter what medium they're, they're working in, um, they're doing an important job uh, of, of covering your community or covering the nation, depending on, on who they work for. Um, first tip number one is to not go in feeling like the reporter is your adversary. Don't think, but don't go in thinking that you're pals either. You want to create a little bit of distance, um, but don't be combative. Um, sometimes when a reporter approaches a source, the source can clam up and immediately go into, into defensive mode. And that turns out badly for everybody because that, that, in, that, that says to us as reporters, ooh, there's something there that I need to get at. So try to resist the urge to go directly into defensive mode, but also don't get too chummy either, because again, they're part of your community and they're doing an important job, but they're not your pals. Um, and most journalists are, are trained to not get too close to a source, um, to continue to keep their objectivity um, and to not be too overly friendly. They wanna be friendly, but not overly friendly. Um, number two, don't tell them anything you don't want in the story. So if you don't want something in the story, don't say it. Um, try to avoid the whole off the record conversation when at all possible, um, just because that gets into tricky territory between you, for you and for the writer or for, and for the journalist. So um, be really clear what the ground rules are. So um, if, if there is something that you do feel like you wanna give on background or off the record, make sure that that is really clear to both you and the reporter. Um, but like I said, don't put up your guard either because that will signal that you're hiding something. So just be a regular person, be conversational, be authentic and be yourself. That can take some practice, um, especially when it comes to um, reporters who have a microphone in your face or a camera in your face. It's hard to feel conversational, conversational and authentic. And that's why practice is really key. Number three, don't make anything up. If you don't know the answer to something, don't even try to fudge it. Just say, you know what? I don't know the answer to that. I will find out that information for you. Don't try to make up things because that will get you into tricky, tricky territory. And the last thing that you want is uh, the, the story to come out the next day and for you to be fudging it basically because someone will call you on it. Um, the reporter might call you on it. So just, I, I do this often. It, it takes a lot of practice to not, I do it with my kids all the time. You know, They ask me a question that I don't know and I just kind of make up the answer. Um, 
don't do that. Practice on your kids if you have children um, for just saying, you know what, I don't know, but I'll look it up. Um, just don't just resist the urge to make it up as you go. Number four, don't try to spin anything. Give facts and put them into context. Context is really important, but context doesn't mean spinning it. If you're telling your story well enough, you don't have to spin anything. We'll talk about that a little bit later in getting really clear with what your story is. If you're clear with what your story is, then you're not trying to make it something that, that it's not. You can massage your story and make sure that it is factual and accurate and that it says what you want to say. But if you try to make it something that it's not by spinning it, then you're going to get in trouble. It's going to come back to bite you. Number five. Remember that the reporter's job is not to make you look good, or it's not to help you tell your story. The reporter's job is to inform and educate their readership. That's their constituency, hard stop. It is not their job to make you look good or help you tell your story. If you can remember that, that it's their job to educate and, and, and inform their readership, then you're going to you're going to you're going to get much better results because if you help the reporter do his or her job by educating and informing your community you're going to be a lot better off than if you think that you should that they should help you do your job because you're always going to be disappointed um you're it's never going to be as flattering as you want it to be um because that's not their job it's not their job to make you to, to flatter you um and to make you look smart or anything that you want to look like um number six don't take the bait and this is a tough one like i said you might occasionally encounter a situation where it does feel like an adversarial relationship um so you might you might come across a reporter who has a preconceived idea of what the story is that happens often, especially with young reporters who do a little bit of research or don't do any research at all. Um, and they think they know the story and it's and it's not the story at all. Um, and that happens sometimes. And there's a gentle and good way to help kind of right the ship. Um, but don't take that bait. Like don't don't get into a fight or don't get into um, don't don't get sucked in to um, proving you're right. Um, there's a gentle way of doing it. You might also encounter reporters who are aggressive. Um, they might seem like they're trying to get you or catch you in something, especially if you're high profile. Um, and again, it's it's different. If you're a regular person, a reporter. Um, approaches you differently than if you're an elected official or if you have power, right? So journalism's role is to hold the power, powerful accountable. And so if you have power, if you're in some sort of uh, public position, it's going to be different. They are going to want to make sure that you're doing everything right and that you, that you're there, that it's going to be a little bit of a different relationship than if you're a regular person who has some knowledge in a particular area and is sharing a story. Try not to get combative and don't ever talk to anybody until you've calmed down. So, you know, if you get a phone call at, or if you, if someone, if a reporter comes up to you and tries to kind of get you, which happens sometimes, um, we try to train everybody to, to, to not be a jerk. That's uh, my colleague Lee Banville. That's the number one rule in media law and ethics is just don't be a jerk. Um, so they, we do teach that, and hopefully most of them learn that. Um, but if someone does come to you and they're being a jerk, or it feels like they're getting the story wrong, or um, if it feels like they're trying to catch you in something just because, don't talk to them until you've calmed down. Take a moment, take a breath, say, you know what, I'm, I'll call you right back. Follow up on that promise. Um, call reporters back when they call you, um, when at all possible. Um, take a take a moment, take a breath, um, get your story right, think of a different strategy to maybe approach this person, um, and then go back to it. The next one is, the next tip is don't feel like you have to talk about everything. It's okay to keep certain things off limits for the interview. If it's just stuff that you don't want to talk about, or maybe it's not for public consumption, that's okay. Don't talk about it. Tell the reporter why you can't or won't or don't want to talk about it if it does come up. 
but don't, if you don't want to talk about it, don't bring it up to begin with. But if you get the question, don't obfuscate and learn how to say obfuscate if you're going to use that word. I don't know how to say it. <laughs> um, but if you get the question, don't go around it. Answer the question given to you. So, um, but tell, but explain why you can't talk about it. Don't just go around it. You see that a lot with, um, with well-trained politicians where um, you ask a question and they won't answer the question. They'll answer, the answer is totally unrelated or it's like slightly tangentially related, but it takes the conversation in a different direction. Don't do that, that's not cool. Um, and most good journalists will call you on it and come back to that question to begin with and then begins the adversarial thing happening. So if, you, if there's something that you don't wanna talk about it, don't ramble about it or you will talk about it on accident, but also, um, just give them a, a really clear answer on why you don't want to talk about it. It's okay to tell the reporter that that's private or that um, it's just not your information to share, or if that information isn't for public consumption yet, um, tell them the reason that you can't talk about it. Being transparent with them about why you don't want to talk about that thing calms the situation down and it establishes the trust between you and the reporter, which is really, 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 really important. So if it's classified or if it's personal or if it's not ready for public consumption, like I said, just tell them that, leave it and move on. Tell them that you'll, you'll, you'll get back to them when it is when, when you do want to share that information. Now, if you can't come up with a good reason, say if you're hiding something just to hide something, that's a great way to get a reporter interested in what you're hiding. And they will start looking right away because sunlight is a disinfectant. And again, it's their job. It's even their responsibility to let that sun, sunlight in. So don't hide something because it, when you do, it's just going to um, entice the reporter to go farther into that. So the best rule is really don't do anything that you have to hide for nefarious reasons. Really, like just basically, if you don't wanna be on the front page of the New York Times for being a jerk, the first thing that you should do is not be a jerk. So just start there. And if you don't have anything to hide, then they're not gonna pick at you. If you do have something that you don't, hiding something is different than not being able to talk about it or not wanting to talk about it and make that make that distinction clear when you're working with a reporter. All of that said, also don't stay on message. That's crap advice. A good reporter can sniff out if you are intentionally saying the same thing over and over again. They can sniff out that like crafted response in seconds. And immediately, again, that signals that, that, they're, that you are feeding them a line that breaks down the trust they're gonna, they're not gonna trust you and then they're gonna go after whatever it is that you're trying to hide. So nobody likes being fed a line, journalists especially. That said, even if you're not staying on message, you should be really clear on the information that you do want to share. That can keep you focused and in the end, it's a much better approach. So all of the above don'ts can be avoided by one big do, which is to be truthful, authentic, and be prepared. And that's where we can help. Whether you've pitched a story, and we can dive deeper into best practices for pitching stories later, if that's something that you would like to do, or if you think would be helpful, or if you just got that phone call or email asking you to do an interview, the key is to be as prepared as possible so that you can stay focused and give the journalist and thus the public, your community, accurate, contextual, focused information. So how do you prepare for an interview? Number one, do some of your own background research. Find out who the reporter is, what's their beat. So most reporters are assigned a beat in their organization. They might, they might cover public health or education or the environment, or um, housing. Um, so find out what their beat is, and then also find out what their angle might be. Good reporters come into a story with an open mind. We teach, that's the first, that's the other first thing I teach is don't go into a story with any preconceived notions, but some reporters will still come to you with a preconceived notion. 
So they might already have an angle or maybe you're a secondary interview or maybe they've already done a bunch of, they, they've already, the story's like half written and they already know the angle and they're calling you after they've done a bunch of reporting. It's helpful for you to know what that angle might be so that you can figure out what kind of information they might need or want. So ask them what their angle is. So you get the phone call, you say, great, um, can I give you a call back? Yes, I'll, I'll answer some questions. Can I give you a call back in a little bit? Hey, by the way, what's the angle of the story? What's, what's your angle? What, what are you thinking about? What kind of information would be helpful for you? And then hang up the phone, do a little bit of research and find out who they are, what their beat is, um, what kind of other stories they've written, what kind of other approaches they've taken, and then call them back after you've done a little bit more of this other prep work. More often than not, you're gonna get an email first to set up a phone call, um, but sometimes you'll just get the call. Sometimes you'll get that cold, cold call, but either way, like I said, take a second, take a breath, tell the reporter that you need a second and call them back. That's always okay. And you'll always give a better interview that way. And the reporters know that they will get a better interview that way too. If you can just say, you know what? Uh, I'm in the middle of something, I'll call you back in a half hour. No, like with many of these tips, things are different. Again, if you're a high profile person, we are taught to treat everybody a little bit differently. So if someone's in the public eye doing the work of the public, like a report, if a reporter's like calling a candidate or an elected official, the scrutiny is always going to be a little bit tighter. And in that initial call and, and always really. So um, sometimes if you're a high profile person, the, the reporter might call you and try to get you on, on um, get, get a comment right away, get you on the record right away. Be prepared for those kinds of phone calls if you're in the middle of something like that. That's a whole other different kind of media training. Um, and we can talk about that more later if, if you'd like. Um, but you do, it's in, in any scenario, it's okay to take a breath hang up the phone, do a little bit of research, get yourself centered and prepared. And, um, and a really good way of getting prepared for an interview is to think like a journalist. So where, you know, we'll start with where all journalists start really, um, which is what makes a story newsworthy. So if you can kind of hang up the phone and put on your journalist hat for a second, um, and think, think through this story, your story, the story that you're about to tell, the way that a journalist would think about it, it can be really helpful in focusing the information that you're, that you're presenting. And it can also just make you a little bit more prepared and natural and, um, and ready for anything. So in general, journalists run every, everything through what becomes a sort of ingrained sense of what makes news news. But in the beginning, journalists start by looking at some basic elements of news, which is what we, in the business, we call news values. Um, and the news values that, that, that most reporters are taught to look for include, number one, impact. So if they're working on a story, the first question that they should ask is, who does this impact? How many people does this impact? Does this, I always tell, because most new journalists um, come to me and they, you know, they have a they have a kind of a sense for news, but they also, because we're in the age of social media, um, they often think that their own little bubble is newsworthy. So I always tell them, you know, what you had for breakfast or what your grandmother had for breakfast is not news because that only matters to you and your grandmother. Um, you want your stories to impact, uh, impact your community. So the first thing that they're looking for, hopefully, is impact. Next one is proximity. So, you know, an earthquake um, in Yellowstone is more newsworthy in Montana than an earthquake on the East Coast somewhere. Proximity matters when, um, when it comes to news values. Immediacy, there's a reason that this is the old joke. There's a reason that it's called news, not olds, right? In order to have a news hook, what we call a news hook, it should be timely. Uh, the story should have some sort of immediacy or timeliness to it. Um, that's not to say that all news is timely. Sometimes, you know, a look back or a historical look, that can be newsworthy too. But generally, that another news value is immediacy or timeliness. Um, novelty is also 
in there, although um, I try to sway my students away from novelty, but the old adage is, is that if a dog bites a man, that's not newsworthy. But if the man bites a dog, that is newsworthy, that novelty thing. Um, and then there's conflict, of course. Usually if there's conflict, if there's smoke, there's fire. Um, so conflict is also something that makes something a little bit more newsworthy. Um, although those two novelty and conflict we try to teach are you know, secondary to the other news values, um, or at least that's my philosophy in, in teaching news, news judgment. Um, and then of course there's the emotional piece. That's another news value that, that most good journalists are looking for. They want to be able to share the human experience through their work. And so emotion is definitely part of that. And most journalists will look at that list of, of news values and they're looking for a story that hits two, three, four of those. It doesn't always have to hit all of those news values, but those are the, those are the things that, um, that help them figure out what is, whether or not this story is newsworthy. And that is what helps them um, figure out also what their angle is going to be. So what's the most prominent news value? Is it impact? Um, is it proximity? Is it emotions? Is it conflict? Um, there's usually one news value that is more um, sussed out in a story. And you'll notice this now when you're reading through the news occasionally. Um, you'll, I hope, I hope you'll carry this with you as you're reading the news or watching the news or listening to the news. Like, oh yes, this is news, newsworthy because X, Y, Z impact. This is newsworthy because of conflict, because of emotions. Now, when you look at this list of news values, it's helpful for you to see which news value you think your story might be, or which story your story might be, or which news value your story might be heaviest on so that you can better know what angle the reporter might take or what angle you might be able to suggest. Again, it's not your job, um, it's, it's, it's not your job to tell the journalist how to work, but most journalists are looking to you, the experts. If they've called you and, you're, and they're doing an interview with you, it's because you know stuff, right? So um, you can and should be able to suggest like, hey, you know what would be a really good angle of this story? This, this, this story impacts a lot of people in my community and here's why. That can really help you not spin the story, but guide the story to make sure that the reporter is getting the most newsworthy parts of the story or what you feel like is the most newsworthy part of the story. And as you're walking through the story that you're telling and checking those boxes to see which, which one of these news values makes my, news, my, my story newsy, Think about um, think about why that matters, and what how you might make the case to the reporter for um, this being an impact story or this being an emotional story. So now that you know a little bit about the news values, you can start to think about doing a little bit of your own pre-reporting. So ask yourself what kinds of information a reporter might need. So if this is a story that you're telling that has, that impacts a lot of people in your community, then that reporter might need data on how many people this story impacts. So think to yourself, okay, I should have some data. I should have that study that we did last year up and ready. Um, also, you can start thinking about what kinds of questions the reporter might ask. And a reporter generally is going to, we're, we're trained to, to look at the who, the what, the when, the where, the how, and the why. And this is where it's really helpful to start doing, like I said, some of your own pre-reporting. So you can think up all the basic questions that a reporter might ask you. Who, who's involved in this story? Who does it impact? What are the basic facts of this story? When did it happen? Where did it happen? How did it happen and why? Um, and start thinking about asking yourself those questions and write them down. Um, start to do your own pre-reporting so that you are, you're already gathering the information that you're gonna share with the reporter. So I don't think we're gonna have time to do that this time around, but just in your own head for right now, Run through those five W's and that H and see if you can answer those basic questions about your organization, about a story that you're pitching, 
um, about a story that you've recently talked to a reporter about. And a few tips as you're doing this. When you're thinking about the who, especially think about the who this story impacts. Like I said before, most good journalists are looking for stories with impact. They're looking to share stories that, that, that matter to people. We're better off if the stories that we read and the stories that we share are rooted in the human story. So if your story is about the impact your work has on other people, think about who else you should suggest a reporter talks to. If, you're, if your work focuses on high-risk youth or at-risk youth, um, help connect the reporter with some of those kids. It's always better if you can be the background source and instead help the reporter focus on the people who are actually affected by whatever your story is. So think about your constituents, think about your, your stakeholders, think about your clients, think about the people that you are working for and think about how you as a person who is being approached by the media, being approached by a reporter, how you can spread the love, how you can help other people tell those stories. Because if a reporter comes in doing a story about at-risk youth, they're gonna call the person who works on at-risk youth. They probably don't know many of those kids. Um, so they're gonna wanna talk to those, to, to the people that, the, that these kinds of stories impact. The why question is always one that you should try to answer before you get on the phone with the reporter. Otherwise, the reporter is gonna to try to find the why themselves and you're the expert. So help the reporter figure out the why. Why is this a story? This is where context comes in and it's really critical that both you and the reporter are clear on the context. If there's one thing other than being misquoted, which is the worst, um, and I know that um, it's when you give solid information, but then a reporter doesn't get the context around the solid information. Um, and it, I've been misquoted a bunch of times. Um, uh, so we can talk about that later. I bet some of you have too. <laughs> um, and that might come up in our questions later. So just make sure that you are really clear on the why, the why this story matters. And that's going to help make sure that the reporter doesn't have to make up why the story matters. And more often than not, they're gonna flub that. They're not the experts. You're the expert on this topic, not them. So help the reporter connect the dots, give them lots of context to help them fully understand an issue. And most good reporters are, are they, they should be not just looking to you to get quotes, um, but looking to you to really understand the issue that you're working on. Um, and so take the time to explain that stuff to a reporter. Um, in, in some of my classes, I tell reporters that it's a lot like, it's a lot like dating. There's a, a lot of the first dates of between a source and a reporter are just getting to know you. It's a lot of deep background and that's okay. Sometimes that's not gonna turn into a story and be okay with that too. Sometimes you're gonna get a call from a reporter. You're gonna spend an hour with them and you're not gonna make it into the story. And that sucks because maybe you wanted to be in that story, but um, maybe some of your context and some of your knowledge that you've imparted got into that story. And the more that that reporter starts to trust you, the more that reporter is going to loop back around to you. So I tell my new reporters to always ask, do I have this right? Especially if it's a complex story and if they're connecting the dots as they go. Some of the best questions start with, it sounds like you're saying, so it's also okay to ask a reporter, do you feel like you've got that? Do you want me to explain that again? Especially if it's a complex topic or a scientific topic or a, you know, something that, take, that has probably taken you decades to figure out, um, that can be hard to communicate uh, to a reporter. So make sure that you're, you're, you have that trust to kind of keep going back and forth and make sure that you're both understanding each other. And that brings me to how you can, how you can get really clear on the bigger questions that a reporter might ask and the ones that you could and should be prepared for. So one of the things, one of the exercises that we'll call this homework. So 
Um, one of the things that I always tell people um, who are working with the working with reporters or working with the media is that if you have a story that you want to tell, or if you are just trying to get raise more awareness for your organization or for the company that you work for or the school that you're at or anything, to sit down and create what I call a one pager. Um, not necessarily a press release. Um, press releases are, they're useful. I just wrote three in the last, you know, few months. Um, and they're useful. And we could talk about, you know, we could do a whole other workshop on how to write a press release. But a uh, one pager is a little bit different than a press release. A one pager is just one page, just like it sounds. And it helps you distill the story so that you can better understand what is newsworthy about your story and help you articulate it. So that you have something to give, something hard copy or over email, a sheet that you can give to a reporter that they can refer to so that they have some backstory and some context, and also so that they have some of the key facts laid out so they can double check their facts and any assumptions. So a press release is like when you want to, you know, when you're having the, like, for instance, we're running a summer camp at the School of Journalism. I just wrote a press release for that. And that's the kind of thing that's like, yeah, you write a press release for that. But if I wanted to raise awareness about the school, I would create a, a one pager um, about the things that I want to talk about, um, the things that I feel like a reporter should know, and some, some of the hard facts that I'm going to be using so that the reporter can then come back and, and check. Because when you're talking to a reporter, they're writing stuff down, they've maybe got their recording on, um, they've got their camera, and so they're ingesting a lot of information. It is a huge download, right, from you to the reporter. They can miss stuff. I can't even tell you how many times my name has been misspelled. Um, a one pager uh, makes that better because number one, it has everything spelled correctly, the way that you want it spelled. And number two, um, it lays out the facts and information that you're giving the reporter so that they can then double check and, and, um, and refer back to it. So it's a, it's a handy thing to be able to give to a reporter. It also um, is an, as an exercise of creating a fact sheet or a one pager, it can really help you distill your information because sometimes the, excuse me, the work that we're doing is all up here. And when we sit down to talk to somebody, it can just kind of blah, it can go everywhere, right? So uh, you want to be able to take a, this exercise helps you distill all of that information that you want to share, that you all that knowledge that you've built up over decades, and helps you distill it in a way that makes it immediately digestible to the reporter as well as the public. So a good one pager should include a solid lead. In the, in the news business, we call the first uh, sentence or paragraph of a story a lead that, um, that helps distill the story down to the nuts and bolts. It should have a list of pertinent facts and it should have proof. So if you're making claims with a reporter about X, Y, or Z, the one pager helps you give some proof, maybe some data to back up the, thing, the, the claims that you're make, making. Um, maybe some quotes from other people, uh, from constituents or from stakeholders, that's really helpful. And then also it should include a quickish narrative on the background of the story, the context. So you'll start by distilling your story into that lead. And you'll do that by first um, getting to the point quickly and fully articulating some of the big stuff that you need a reporter to know. So you do that by creating what I call your th the, the magic three to five things. Like I said before, the, the, the advice to stay on message is crappy um, because it just makes you sound like a robot. But knowing what you wanna say and how you wanna stay and how you wanna say it helps you stay in bounds when you're talking to a reporter. And it really helps you focus on what you're trying to say. So come up with three, the three to five things that you think the reporter or the public needs to understand about this story, about the thing that you're working on, um, about your work, about your organization, about your life, whatever it is that you're being interviewed about. Think about the three to five things that you want that reporter or the public to understand and know. And then take those three to five things and rank them in order of importance. List Rank right. My other colleague, Jewel Banville, um, uses this when she's teaching lead writing, and I stole it, and I love it. 
um, list the things, then rank the things in order of importance, of importance, and then sit down to write. Using what you know after doing all of that about the ingredients of a good story, um, take a moment and come up with a few paragraphs explaining the narrative, like I said, the why it matters to the reporter and, to, and more importantly, to the public. It's really hard to do this. So set aside you know, an hour of your time. Maybe you can get it done in a half hour, but set aside some time to really sit and think about how you wanna communicate this topic. It's a really good practice just to sit down, write this one pager, do the list rank right, come up with your three to five things. Um, it's gonna help you communicate in a much more fluid and authentic way. Then you can use, then you can use that fact sheet as a follow-up to the interview, or you can use it as something you send to the reporter before the interview to help them craft their questions. This is gonna allow you to prepare both what to say and how to say it. So in the end, you end up helping the reporter get their facts straight and in context, and you get to use your voice to bring that information to life. Um, one of our first participants in this workshop was, was a woman named Erin Languth. She's a scientist at UM, and she's an expert in particulate matter. And last spring, all of a sudden, her research specifically into particulate matter and how it affects virus transmission was a pretty hot topic. So Anne and I helped her write a one page fact sheet to prepare for the flood of press inquiries she was getting. And Erin described herself as pretty nervous when it came to doing interviews. And she said that this prep of doing the fact sheet and then also Anne's prep, which you'll get to in a little bit, really helped her and made a huge difference um, and she said, especially the three to five things exercise. So even if you don't have the time to do a full fact sheet or a full one pager, take a few minutes um, before you pick up the phone and call that reporter again to do that three to five things exercise that can really, really help list rank right. Um, and at last count, Erin had used her fact sheet um, to nail nearly 20 placements in places like the Oregonian and the New York Times and uh, Sacramento TV station, Montana Public Radio, National Public Radio, and even National Geographic, just to name a few big ones. Um, and and she she's she uh, generously shared her fact sheet, and we can look at that if you'd like to. Um, maybe even later on after Anne's done, if we have some time, I can show you her fact sheet um, uh, as a, as an example of how to format it and kind of what you're looking for. But like I said. Just the process of, of either writing a full fact sheet, a full one pager fact sheet, or um, doing this three to five things thing, um, just that process is gonna help you think more clearly about what your story is and what matters about it and who it matters to. And if you can keep those things in mind, you're gonna be much more relaxed and more focused and more human. And you're just gonna tell stories better and you're gonna help that reporter tell stories better. Oh, good. Okay. So Tam says, definitely be interested in the example of a spreadsheet. Okay. Of, of the fact sheet. Okay, good. So we'll, we'll take some time and we'll, um, we'll walk through that after Anne is done. Great. So I'll hand it over to Anne who can talk to you about how to uh, prepare for, for that scary microphone or camera in your face. Totally. Thanks, Courtney. Okay, everyone. So I am going to share my screen with you really quickly and just um, talk you through a little bit of what Courtney mentioned. So how do you feel comfortable on camera? How do you um, get the message across that you want to get across? And I'm going to talk a, kind of specifically from a journalist perspective. So when I go into, um, you know, do a video story or a radio story, what am I looking for? Like, what do I need from you? So let me share my screen and then I'll keep going. Okay. So can everyone see this? Yes, okay, great. All right, so as I said in my introduction, my background is primarily in photojournalism and video. Um, I've worked at um, WGBH in Boston as a, both a video reporter and a uh, radio reporter. 
And I've also just created a lot of um, kind of short documentaries. And I feel like I have a good sense of what works, you know, what, what a visual journalist needs and what a, a radio uh, reporter needs. So the first thing I wanna talk about is just what, what are reporters looking for? What do they need from you? Because I think when you go into a situation where you're about to be interviewed, the tendency is, you know, you feel nervous, probably you're like, oh, I gotta, you know, I, I wanna hit on this point and this point and this point so that I get the story across that I wanna tell, which is all great. But a reporter is coming into it with sort of a different perspective. They're coming into it with like certain things that, that they need to get from you. And what they're really hoping for are short quotes that are clear and condensed explanations of complicated issues. Um, so for example, if you're you know, talking about housing issues and there's a lot of lingo in the housing world um, that other people don't know, but it's so second nature to you to talk in those terms, that's going to be kind of a nightmare for me as a reporter when I'm cutting the story together, you know, an hour later, or a day later, um, because I need to have things that are clear for my audience. So if you are sort of in a world where, you know, we say this a lot with scientists, like if you're a scientist, you're going to talk in a way that I'm not probably going to understand. Right. And so your job when you're about to be interviewed is to is to really take a complicated issue that you understand very easily and put it into terms that, you know, a third grader would understand. OK. So, again, no science, no techie speak. Um, if there are a lot of abbreviations in, in the world that you live in, um, try to really think about those before you say them and define what those are. Because if you don't, if you're just like, you know, blah, 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 all these little, you know, what are those called acronyms when they're like the letters that stand for things. Um, you're, you know, me as a journalist, I'm going to, I'm going to have to say like, okay, could you tell me what that stands for? And then it's, it's not going to be usable as a quote. So as a TV or radio reporter, I'm also looking for emotional moments and animated moments. So you don't have to cry on screen, although we would love it if you would. Um, but, but we want you to have some sort of, we're hoping that, that you have some sort of emotional connection to, to the story that you're telling or the work that you're doing. Um, it doesn't really serve us well on our end as reporters if, if you're very scripted if you, you know, we can tell that you've kind of memorized responses to questions you think that we as reporters might ask, that doesn't humanize you and it doesn't really humanize the story you're trying to tell or the organization you're with. So although it may make you feel comfortable to have rehearsed a bunch of things, let's say uh, the night before an interview, because you're like, okay, I know what I'm gonna say, I'm gonna say this thing, we can sniff that out and, it, and we're trying to tell a story that that has some life to it. So we're looking for emotion, we're looking for animated moments. This is a tricky one that people never think about until um, someone on the other side of the camera, or the other side of the microphone explains it to them. So when you are talking about something, uh, let's say the housing crisis in Missoula, um, we need you to say what that thing is in your answer. So if I say in an interview, um, so the housing crisis in Missoula is, is just out of control. Um, you know, there, there are no rentals available. The, the cost of houses are through the roof. Um, why, why do you think that's happening, right? And your answer is, well, it's because we have people coming in from out of state and they're buying everything up. And it's because, um, you know, we don't have enough uh, housing available on the market. All I'm thinking as a reporter is like, ah, oh, you did not say what it is, right? So you need to have said the housing crisis is happening in Missoula because, you know, there, there are no rentals available or because we don't have enough of a housing supply. Um, so just kind of being cognizant of, of how you're responding. And it's very natural for us to not say the thing in a, in a response to a question, 
You know, if someone asks me, do you like ice cream? I say, yeah, I like it, right? But all that I have to use as a reporter when I go back to sit down at my computer and edit is the thing that you have said. My questions will not, 99% of the time will not be in a piece that I produce, right? So all I have when I sit down is, in my example there, I like it. It doesn't say like, I like ice cream, right? So, so just trying to think, you know, change your thinking a little bit so that you um, indicate the thing that you've been asked about in your response, okay? If you don't do this, a good journalist will rephrase the question and sort of try to get you to say it again they're never gonna say, we need you to say that thing in your answer because we're not allowed to sort of direct you in your responses. But we are, we will try to re-ask the question in hopes that you will say it in a way that is usable for us as a sound bite or as a video bite. And we don't love rambling. So, you know, you're gonna be nervous probably if it's, if you haven't done interviews a lot. Um, taking time to prepare ahead of time will help you not be rambly. But if you ramble a lot, it is sort of a nightmare for us as reporters because we have to take that ramble and cut it down into the clear and condensed quotes that we're looking for. And it's not, it's not easy. Um, the other thing to remember is that reporters are on deadlines and you as someone you know, working for an organization, you're, you're hoping to get a great story maybe out of an interview that you do. Um, you might think that you have like two hours worth of things that you need to talk about to a reporter so that they can tell a good story. And the reality is depending on if they're, if the reporter is working for a daily or like working for you know, some sort of tight turnaround story, um, they're not gonna be able to sit there and, and have you talk for two hours. Right. So they are going to come in and they might ask only a few questions and then they'll wrap up and you might think, whoa, I was just getting started. How is this possibly over already? I haven't gotten to what I really was wanting to talk about. And that a good journalist will always at the end of an interview say something along the lines of, is there anything else that you would like to talk about that we didn't discuss? And that is sort of your moment to shine. That is when you can say, yeah, actually the, you know, the biggest concern I have is X, Y, or Z, or, you know, the main issue we're focusing on as an organization is X uh, because of Y, right? So, you know, use that last question to really put out anything that um, you want to talk about that you didn't get a chance to talk about. All right, so then there's this question of, well, what do you need, right? So that's what a reporter is, is needing to make a story out of, what do you need? You need to get your message across clearly, right? Um, you wanna come across looking or sounding professional and polished. And you wanna get people excited or interested or concerned or angry or, or whatever about the story you're telling or about your organization. So that, those are the pieces that you're looking for, right? And, and the big question is kind of like, okay, how do you, how do you get across what you want to get across in a way that fits the sort of model that a reporter needs in order to tell a good story, right? And the best way to, to make this thing happen, to marry the two, is to be prepared and know what to expect. And Courtney talked about this as well. But you really want to have your brain kind of go into a bit of a journalist mode before you're interviewed by a journalist, right? Courtney talked about, you know, all the things that journalists may want to ask or how they will approach uh, an interview. And it's very similar in audio and radio, right? You need to be prepared and being prepared includes sending out that one pager that Courtney talked about that has you know information about your organization it has um, maybe some statistics about the story that you're trying to tell it kind of hands the reporter information so that they're not gonna make something really crappy because they only had you know five minutes with you or something um you want to think like a journalist ahead of time so it's it's no different than i always think of it as almost uh, preparing for a job interview right you don't want to roll into a job interview and just be like, 
what do you got for me? What are you going to ask? Like you, you want to really have thought the night before or the week before, what is this person probably going to ask me? And so if, if like Courtney said, you, you've asked what the reporter's angle is, maybe in a phone call ahead of the interview, you will know kind of, okay, they're going to come into this interview. They have a certain angle in mind. Based on that angle, I'm guessing they're going to want to ask me X, Y, and Z. And so then you're going to really sit down and prep. How am I going to concisely answer X, Y, and Z? And you don't want to sit down and, and script it. You don't want to sit down and sort of memorize your responses because invariably you'll you know, be nervous and then you'll, you'll forget how you were supposed to answer a thing. You want to just be prepared to address whatever questions you think they might ask and really think about what are the key points that you want to get across, right? So instead of sitting down and, and you know, thinking, okay, they're probably gonna ask me these three questions. Here's how I'm gonna to respond to the first one and like writing it out and memorizing it. Just have sort of a like, they're gonna ask me this question. And I know that when I respond to that, I wanna hit on this point, this point, and this point. And then, you know, when that question comes to you, you've got your three points that you know you wanna hit and how you talk about them is gonna feel more natural, right? Than if you, if you write it out. Um, so really think about that. Think about what questions are the, is the reporter likely to ask? Think about the one question that you really hope they don't ask and figure out a good answer for that question. Because if a journalist is a good journalist, he or she is going to ask you that question. You know, he or she will have done research enough to, to be like, huh, I wanna know about this because I read a little bit about this and it seems like a little suspicious or a little fishy or seems like the numbers don't add up. And that's the question that a reporter is going to ask you. So if you have that sort of feeling of like, God, I hope they don't ask me that question, you better have a really good answer for that question because that, that question will be asked. So again, it's, they're not there. I'm not going into, a, into an interview sort of like, oh, I'm going to totally nail them on this question. Like I don't have a sort of malicious, you know, intent when I'm doing an interview. But as a journalist, my job is to really do the research ahead of time on the story I'm trying to report on and ask the questions that are hard. So, you know, be prepared for those kinds of questions. And then just practice, you know, practice like you would if you were going to have a job interview the next day. Um, not knowing exactly what you're going to be asked, but knowing, you know, a few things that you're probably going to be asked. And really think about what do you want to get across in that final question, the one that is probably going to be posed to you that says, um, you know, is there anything that we didn't talk about that you want to talk about? So think about how you would answer that, because again, that's sort of your time to get anything out that you um, didn't have the chance to do before. The other thing is just knowing what to expect. So part of getting nervous about doing a TV or a radio interview is that if you haven't done it before, you, you kind of don't know what's going to happen and that can make you feel anxious. So knowing what is going to happen can put you a little bit more at ease. And most radio and TV interviews are going to follow this sort of same format. If it's a TV interview uh, or a video interview, there might be lights that get set up. So you're just kind of milling around while they set up lights. They'll probably put you in a chair where they want you to sit. Um, they're going to, in either audio or video, they'll always do a, what's called a mic check to check for audio levels. So probably someone is going to hook you up with a lavalier mic or um, a boom mic, which is a mic that just kind of comes above you and is out of the visual frame. And they're going to say, okay, we're just going to check levels right now. Can you tell me what did you eat for breakfast or you know, talk to me about your dog or something? And that's just to check sound levels. Uh, the first question is always going to be, can you introduce yourself? I've never done an interview where I haven't started with that. So, you know, that's going to be your first one. It's going to be an easy one. You should hopefully know the answer to that question. Uh, and then again, the last question is going to be some variation of, is there anything else that you'd like to say that we didn't touch on today? Uh, what's going to happen in the middle is, you know, all the stuff that we just talked about previously. Generally, you know, if I'm doing an interview, I'll have a 
couple of sort of easy questions to start out, especially if I can tell if the person if the person seems nervous. Um, you know, so I might ask questions that I don't even really need um, answers to, but I want the person to feel a little more comfortable before um, before I get into anything that's a little more serious. So you might have a few kind of easy questions at the beginning and you think like, God, this is like the most lightweight interview I've ever done. But those might be just sort of warming you up and then get then the reporter will get to a little bit of the meat of the interview. Um, the other thing is that the uh, at the very end, um, uh, an inner a reporter may kind of circle back to th something. So again, as a reporter, I'm thinking in my head, did I get everything I need? Did I get quotes that I need? And I'm listening for good quotes as I'm interviewing you. Um, so if I get to the end and I've asked my, is there anything else you'd like to, you know, say question, and I still feel like mm, I don't feel like I really got what I needed about this one topic, I might say, you know, I just had one more question that, that I wanted to ask, you know, we talked about X earlier, can you tell me a little bit more about blah, 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 right, and that's just my like attempt, my last attempt to get you to say something uh, in a way that's usable. The other thing to remember is that uh, you don't get the chance to review a piece, whether it's a radio piece or a video piece for the news, for TV, you don't get to review it before it goes to air. And if you ask, you'll be told no. <laughs> uh, that happens only if it's sort of a marketing piece or you hire, as an organization, you hire someone to produce uh, a commercial piece about you, then yes, absolutely, you get to review it and have input. But because it's journalism, um, you don't get to see it or hear it before it goes to air. So don't be surprised about that. A couple of just sort of very, you know, basic logistical things. When you're doing an interview for video or for TV, it's good to wear solid colors. Don't wear patterns. Avoid uh, white, avoid bright red, and avoid black. So in terms of colors that you're wearing. Um, teal, cobalt, purple, coral, anything in that range is good. And especially if it's an audio interview and you're wearing jewelry, um, try not to have like dangly stuff because it'll make noise. Um, the other thing is if you are doing either a video or TV interview and you have a scarf on um, or you have long hair and you're wearing what's called a lavalier mic, you're, the person interviewing you will be very uh, concerned about whether that mic is getting sound from the scarf rubbing on it or your hair rubbing on it. So if you have long hair, maybe pull it back for an interview just to avoid that. Um, so this one for TV and video is really important. Don't look directly at the camera unless you are told to do so. You want to talk directly to the reporter. And again, a good journalist, a good reporter will will tell you to do this, right? But I've had so many people say, where, where am I supposed to look? Am I supposed to look at you? Or am I supposed to look at the camera? And, and there's a tendency to feel like you should look at the camera and that's not the case. So it feels very intense if you, if you do an interview with someone and the whole time they're looking like dead into the camera. Um, so you wanna have it feel conversational and your job is to just have a conversation with the reporter. And they will position you in a way so that you're not like looking up or you're not looking down on the frame. Um, this is important and I think something that people don't always think about. A lot of times uh, reporters are one man or one woman bands, right? They have to do a video interview. They also have to monitor the sound while they're interviewing you. And it can feel if you're being interviewed by someone who's doing both those things, it can feel like that person isn't paying attention to you, that they're, they're a bit distracted. Uh, to an extent they are, they're trying to do two things at once, um, plus ask you questions, but know that they are paying attention, but they also have to monitor, you know, is everything still looking okay in the camera? Is everything still sounding okay in the audio? And so they're sort of doing a lot of things at once. So if it feels like you're trying to, you know, have this like super heart to heart with someone, and you know that person is looking down at the camera or their audio recorder. It's just the nature of the beast. If you mess up, it is okay to start over. Um, you know, but but remember that you 
we are only going to use bits of what you say anyway, and we're going to edit it in a way that makes the quotes sound the best. We're not going to change the meaning of what you're saying, but we, if you, if you, you know, like, uh, 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 and then you say your thought, we will cut out the, uh, 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 uh. we're not, we're not, we're not going to try to make you look bad. So you can start over, but I've had situations where I've done an interview and someone is just like, wait, 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 can I do that again? And then they start again. They're like, oh no, wait, I want to do it again. And it doesn't have to be perfect. Our job as, as editors is to sit down and sort of clean up what you've said to make it coherent. Everything is very similar in the radio world, um, but one with one difference. So this was sort of pre-COVID. Reporters, when a reporter is interviewing you for radio, the reporter will have some sort of microphone. I always use a pen, but it's gonna be very close to your face. It's gonna be like within a fist distance of your mouth. And so that means the reporter is going to be physically close to you. So it, that can feel pretty intense. You're, we're not used to having someone up in our space that much. Uh, nowadays with COVID issues, you'll find more radio people are using boom mics. So again, sort of an extended mic where they can stand back and the microphone will kind of hang down by your mouth, but they'll be holding a big pole and they'll be six feet away from you. Or they'll use the lapel mic, the sort of lavalier mic on your shirt. Um, or they'll do what is called a tape sync. A tape sync is when someone, um, it's a little confusing, but basically if, if, if they're doing, if someone from Washington DC wants to interview you in Missoula, Montana, and they wanna make sure that you in Missoula have really good audio quality on your, um, on your sound. And instead of having you go to a studio in Missoula, they will send someone to your house to physically hold a microphone close to you while they're while you're having a phone conversation with the person in Washington DC and they will record your end of the conversation in a really good quality send it to the person in Washington DC and they will sort of um, marry that together with the audio of the person who was interviewing you in Washington DC and the, the feeling will be like you were in a studio with that person who was interviewing you uh, the other option that's happening more and more with COVID is this idea of um, recording with your smartphone. So if you are being interviewed by someone in Washington, D.C., uh, that person might say, could you just hold a phone and hit record with your voice memo? And, um, you know, while we're having this conversation afterwards, send me the file from your phone so that I have good audio quality. Again, expect the reporter to be checking levels throughout. Um, and again, to feel that it might feel a little distracting. And the same with TV, if you mess up, it is totally okay to start over. Um, but remember that you will be edited down to only your best quotes anyway. Um, so I think overall, the thing that I just really wanna stress to everyone is that if you are prepared, you've thought like a journalist thinks before you go into an interview, to the extent that you've thought of some questions you might be asked and you have prepared how you will respond to those questions, that's you're, you're gonna have a much better interview than if you just sort of roll in and are like, okay, what are you gonna ask me? And, and then you feel kind of on the spot because you haven't prepared for a question. Um, so practice just like you would if you were doing some sort of a, a job interview. Um, you wouldn't roll into those completely cold. You would you would have thought about what you might get asked, and you would have you will have thought of some kinds of answers. Uh, the other thing, don't be scripted. As much as it's gonna, you may want to do that and think that it's gonna help you. It's not gonna help you because invariably you you'll be nervous. You'll forget what you wrote that you, was a response to a specific question. So just know the talking points that you want to get across and try to be natural as much as you can try to be animated try to be excited about the topic you're you're being interviewed about um, there's nothing worse for us as a reporter than doing an interview with someone who is just so colossally boring and we have to figure out how to <laughs> take little bits of 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 what a boring person has said and try to make it sound interesting so that is all I have. Um, I would love any questions and I know Courtney um, would be happy to answer questions as well. Uh, Courtney, do you think we should do the sort of mock interview or what are you thinking? Does anyone, does anyone want to volunteer? Does anyone have, have a burning desire to, to try out 
some of these things? No. Like, no way, I don't want to be put on the spot for this. <laughs> That's okay. Um, I yeah. know that Tam wanted to see um, the fact sheet. So maybe I could just quickly show that. Um, and then does, does anyone, as I'm doing that, um, start getting your questions ready. Um, think like a reporter, come up with some, some good questions. Um, we're happy to answer questions or even, you know, do like mini consults. If you have an issue, if you've had an issue in the past, um, that you want to talk about and we can walk through that, um, that would be good too. Let yeah, and I was just going to say participants, we have so few of us that if you do want to come off video, um, come off hiding and come on to video, we would love that as well and super welcome that. So please feel free to do that. And I have heard Courtney and Ann do it once before. It's just the information they have is so valuable and so fantastic. So thank you guys. But Absolutely. we get some questions for them. Okay, I'm going to share my screen real quick. I'm going to show this. Um, so you're all seeing my screen here. Um, this is the fact sheet that Erin Landguth did, um, and it gives her full title up at the top, as you can see. That's really helpful, right, so that they get your name and your title correct. Um, she's got a good summary here. That's that lead where she took the kind of the three to five things and, and distilled it down. Instead of, a, a lot of people will um, start at the beginning. Um, as opposed to the, you know, as opposed to drilling into the most newsy parts of it. So you, you want your summary to be, um, to be, be a, like I said, a distillation of those three to five things that you've thought about that you want to share, as opposed to a, back in 2015, we launched a study on particulate matter that blah, 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 right? So that's, that's what we call backing into the story. You want to just dive right in. And then she has her, she, she got extra credit. She went from three to five to six things, but she got her six facts in here. Um, and then what does this, and then the impact, right? The context, a little bit of narrative down below on what this actually means. And so this is something that she sent around and I'm gonna share, um, I'll show you. So this is uh, one of her stories from um, from National Geographic, uh, published this summer. And I'm going to show you her quote because it's it gets at one of the oopsies at one of the at a few of the things that we've talked about. So you can see um, they get her name correctly. They get her the context. Um, she they set up the quote, and um, right here, this is the impact, right? She's talking about particulate matter from wildfire smoke. It wreaks havoc on, our, havoc on our lungs. That's the money quote right there. That's the quote that, that someone's gonna use because they that that's what immediately like resonates with you as a reader. Oh, instead of saying, well, it causes problems by constricting the blah, 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 blah. She just like nails it in regular person terms. And then um, Here's another quote from her. We have evidence that it suppresses immune system and it causes inflammation in the, in the cells of our lungs. It's a really good quote for a uh, for a print reporter, but for for an audio or a video reporter, that would suck, right? Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. yeah, because yeah. we don't know what it is. Okay. So if you were on if you were on radio or on video, you'd say we have evidence that particulate matter su suppresses immune response and it causes inflammation in the cells of our lungs. Mm -hmm. So. That's just one example. Um, here's Aaron in the New York Times. Um, and there, so, and reporters will use quotes in different ways. Like Ann said, um, we're looking for quotes that convey emotion. We're looking for quotes that can convey impact. We're looking for quotes that can convey opinion. So good, good reporters um, won't opine themselves. They need they need you to 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 make the opinions or to to say the opinions for for them. Um, they are they are trained not to even use the language of opinion in our writing. We want to stay as objective as possible and allow you to do the opining on your own. Um, so it's not our job to make um, 
to make judgments. It's not our job to make inferences. It's not our job to, um, to give an opinion. That's your job. That's your job as the source. So keep that in mind too, that the quotes that are often going to be used are going to be ones that um, convey information, color, emotion, and opinion. So the, that, that's the two. Do you want me to go back to the, should I go back to the, um, it's really simple. This, um, this fact sheet is really simple. It's nothing fancy, right? It's just her name, the facts that she feels are information for the reporter to understand this story and the impact, right? We don't want the reporter um, coming up with the why in this story. She wants to give the reporter, what, what does this mean? But yeah, and Aaron was, was like very nervous about being interviewed on audio or video about her background. And obviously she's in huge demand. She's doing research that's very important and relevant um, nationally. And uh, she did say that after doing the fact sheet, she felt like she had a much like calmer approach to being interviewed. So I think just the, the exercise of doing the fact sheet, it's useful for obviously for a reporter who's getting ready to do a story and do an interview on you, but it's also useful for you to just really you know, even if you never sent it anywhere to just sort of distill down the important parts of, you know, your organization or your story that you're trying to tell. It, I think it, I think it's helpful, even if you don't end up even sending it out to anybody. For sure. And it's good, it's good internally too, just in your organizations to think about writing up, you know, if you've got a hot story, um, think about as a group putting something like this together and practicing interviewing each other to see how you're doing. Um, because like Anne said, practice really is, is key um, to articulating some of the things that you want to articulate. Yeah, in the past when we've taught this workshop, we've had a little more time and we've done an exercise where we actually pair up participants and have each participants email the other person a fact sheet and then each person interviews the other and we record the zoom uh, interview and then they share that with us so that we can look and give a little feedback um, but it, i think just going through that exercise of, of actually being interviewed by someone even if you know it's an exercise <laughs> it is amazing how quickly you will see where you get stuck mm -hmm. so you know you, a, a question that shouldn't be even hard you get stuck on, then you know, okay, whoa, I got to work on that because that, that should not be a hard thing for me to answer. And I just totally flubbed it. So if you have, you know, time and you, you're worried about how you're going to interview, then just practice with somebody in your organization and um, you'll know very quickly where you get stuck and that's where you can practice. Yeah. And if you're doing a lot of interviews regularly, it's easy to get cocky and feel like you got it, you know, like, oh, I talk about this all the time. Or if it's, um, sometimes if it's something personal, you know, like if it's not even about your work, if it's like a feature story that's just about you and your life, um, it can, it, I've gotten totally stuck on that kind of stuff before um, where I haven't like fully thought out the questions that someone might ask. And, um, and I, I totally flub it. I either ramble or I just kind of get lost and I can't answer the question. Like, something simple like why do you do this work why does this work matter you know answer those kinds of questions too um those general questions that that might come up in an interview and we talked a little bit about whether it's okay to you know ask if you can redo something and i think one in one instance where i think it is okay to sort of be like i need a minute before i answer I have a reaction where if I get nervous, I just turn like bright pink. Like, I mean, it's like visibly, it's, it's very obvious. Um, so if you feel, if you have something like that, you feel like, oh my God, I'm just like totally like electric red right now. And you're on camera and you, you you're just like, I don't want this. Um, it's okay to be like, you know what, can I just like have a minute and then um, can we start again? Or, you know, can you ask me that question again? It's totally fine. Nobody is ever going to be like, sorry, we only want the take of you where you look like you were sweating like profusely. 
<laughs> that's not good for us either. Yeah, if you yeah, if you have one of those things, I don't know if I should share this or not. But my husband has a sniffle thing when he gets nervous. He start his nose starts to run. I don't know what happens, but his nose starts to run, and so it's a lot of sniffling. And um, we, you know, we've been he's done a bunch of interviews uh, for the business where he is. You know, I I just think about the poor editor who's having to edit out all those sniffles. So it's totally fine to take a moment. Yeah, if you have something like that where you're just like, ah, can I take a minute? Well, that's fantastic. If there are no other questions we can give people, or you guys don't have any other parting thoughts, we can give people a few minutes back of their day, but um, any any last questions for these two fantastic ladies? Nope. Courtney and Anne, we appreciate you guys so much. I know really? that this is a scary topic sometimes, trying to figure out how we approach media, how we do that. Um, we appreciate it so much. So thank you guys for joining us. And all of you guys who attended, thank you also for joining us. This concludes day one of the conference. We yeah. have arrived at the end of day one of the conference. Um, we look forward to seeing all of you guys tomorrow morning for the optional coffee talk at 8 a.m. and then the plenary session beginning at 9. Remember, continue those community conversations in the Whova app. Um, there's a lot of fantastic conversation happening over on Hoover right now in the community conversations. I mean, tons and meetups being planned and all of that. There's tons going on. So check that out. But we just really appreciate you guys. And thank you for attending. Thanks, Thanks everybody. Bye. Have a good rest of the afternoon. Bye.